Cool. So I'll just wait for the recording. Awesome. I've just got the notification. The recording's been started. So welcome everyone to our Power BI for Enviro's meetup. Um, our mission is to share different case studies, uh, learn new tips and tricks, and really empower other Enviro's on their Power BI journey. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, any new members? Welcome all the uh, old members. Um, thanks for coming back. I think uh, last time we checked, I think we're up to about maybe um, 1,600 members. So that's awesome. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, for coming along um, every month. It's great to have everyone here. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we dive into it. Um, if you have the Teams app, uh, that's the best experience. Um, if not, you can use the online version. Uh, just remember to mute yourself uh, when you're not speaking to avoid any feedback. If you have questions, um, we'll go through questions at the end of each presenter today, but type them in the chat as you think of them, um, and then I can um, I'll moderate the session as well. Um, or if you want to in the Q&A session, um, please go off mute and um, feel free to sh turn on your video if you want to ask a question directly. Um, so just a reminder, the session is being recorded um, and we'll share it afterwards on our YouTube channel and with the Meetup group. Uh, before we dive in, I just want to give a quick acknowledgement of country. Um, so we want to acknowledge the traditional owners um, on the lands on which uh, lands and waters on which we're presenting today uh, from the Mornington Peninsula, um, but also acknowledge uh, the traditional owners um, of other people who are dialing in from the call um, and our other presenters here today as well. Uh, just a quick note about uh, Discovery AI. Um, so we help to coordinate and run this group. Um, at Discovery AI, we provide um, really anything to do with Power BI for the environmental industry. So we provide Power BI training and mentoring. Uh, we've got Daniel, lucky us, uh, Power BI custom visual developer, Deneb, extraordinaire, end-to-end uh, -end reporting, infographics and animations, and also uh, environmental analytics. So get in touch if you have any questions about that. Um, but let's get started. Let's dive into what we're all here uh, today for, uh, which is having a look at the Great Barrier Reef, uh, CELT MP and RRC uh, dashboards. So we've got um, Patina presenting uh, first today from CSIRO. Uh, she'll run through a bit of a background um, of the study um, and give us an overview. Um, I'll then uh, do a little bit of um, uh, a discussion about the Power BI components and really visualizing survey data in Power BI, a couple of um, tips if you wanted to tackle this yourself um, and what we learned throughout the project. And then we've got Daniel here to present um, on a really cool custom visual which um, uh, he created for this project in Deneb. Um, so he'll dive in then, um, but we'll take questions at the end of each um, presenter. Um, so Patina, over to you. If you wanted to, I'll stop sharing screens if you wanted to start sharing. Um, and um, we'll just have some questions at the end of your session. Okay. Um, is it sharing now or I need to share, reshare again? I think reshare. Yes, yeah, okay. so just try resharing. Is that the right one? Have a look. Um, perfect. Yeah, that looks really good. Yeah, OK. Anyway, um, yeah, thanks, everybody. And thanks, Alice, for inviting me to uh, present on our project. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land on, I'm presenting from, which is um, the Bindle people and the neighbouring uh, Woolgaroo Kabar people from the Townsville region. and. Um, I'm working from home here at Magnetic Island and wish to pay our respects to the Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge um, our partners in this project, um, which is currently funded by a partnership between the Australian Government's Reef Trust and the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, and um, also the in-kind support from um, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and um, the Office of the Great Barrier Reef uh, department and um, the regional report card uh, communities and other key partners. Um, this presentation is mainly um, the results um, that were presented uh, to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and um, there's a brief introductory overview of what CELTEMP is 
Um, so CELTEMP basically stands for the Social and Economic Long-Term Monitoring Program, um, what we do and why. Um, but um, if you have any uh, notes or questions that you're interested in um, or further information, just um, put it in the chat and we'll get to you at the end of the uh, presentation. Um, okay, uh, so this is the team. Um, so Matt Kernock and Aditi are the project leaders. Um, we also have uh, Liz Hosman, um, Ingrid Van Putin, uh, Dave Fleming, and myself. Um, we all we all have um, various different roles. Um, there's a pretty good mix of social science disciplines, um, resource economics, behavioural and, and social uh, psychology. Um, myself, I'm a, like a spatial analyst and data person and um, yeah, other kind of variety of people. Um, what is CellTemp and what does it do? Uh, CellTemp has been around for a decade now, um, but for those who are unfamiliar, it's a, a monitoring program and that helps to improve our understanding of the human dimension components of the Great Barrier Reef as a social ecological uh, system. The sorts of things that we monitor um, in plain English include reef users and communities, uh, so use, values and benefits derived from the Great Barrier Reef, perceptions, attitudes and normative beliefs, uh, stewardship activity, enablers and barriers, trust and support for management and community dependence on the Great Barrier Reef, vulnerability and adaptive capacity to change. Um, but how can CellTemp help you, the reef managers, and how can you use this information in your decision making processes? Uh, like most of um, other monitoring programs that contribute to the RIMREP, uh, which is um, Gabrumpa's Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority's uh, monitoring program, the first and most straightforward thing that we do is gather time series di data to evaluate and track progress towards objectives in the Reef 2050 plan. And in our, our case, there's um, five human dimension objectives. And those constructs shown on the previous slide may directly to these objectives of numerous indicators outlined in the Reef 2050 plan. And the cell temp results have also featured quite prominently in the last two outlook reports that uh, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority um, produces. And um, the second application is to help drive adaptive management and by helping you better understand your audience and thus helping you to engage with them better to achieve your management goals. And CellTemp also um, can give you feedback on your performance as reef managers in the eyes of community and, in, and it can help us all to improve our system understanding such as how natural events or reef management initiatives affect people and vice versa. Um, so we're up to kind of versions mark three of uh, cell temp. Um, so what's changed in the past years? Uh, cell temp was originally designed um, in 2011 to 2013. Um, it had a theoretical th frame, framework which was based on the Millennium, Millennium Ecosystems, uh, Ecosystem Assessment, so the MEA, and this remains relevant and applicable today. However, the introduction of the Reef 2050 plan in 2015 and its refinement in the last couple of years prompted us to fine tune our met metrics to make sure cell temp data will be effective for evaluating progress towards uh, those objectives in the 2050 Reef plan. So we're now in cell temp's third iteration and we've made some updates to what we measure and how we measure it. The original cell temp collected data primarily was through face to face interviews, um, thousands of them up and down the coast with teams of research assistants in the field for over a couple of months. Um, unfortunately, COVID put a stop to us doing that, so we um, pivoted and we've got a new online methods which allow us to collect high quality data at a much lower cost. And CellTemp has also been refined to address new science and management questions associated with rapid ecological change and emerging management issues such as reef interventions. Um, before I uh, launch into our latest results, um, we've, in the last couple of uh, months we've published two new technical reports and there's a report from the core module which is a comprehensive 
descriptive results from the 2021 Great Barrier Reef Survey data that we did. And this report is structured around the five human dimension objectives of the Reef 2050 plan. Um, and you can download those reports from um, at that website there. Uh, the results I'm showing today are drawn from this report. Uh, the second report outlines the design and impl implementation of social surveys that contribute to new human dimension monitoring in the catchment by the five regional report cards of the Great Barrier Reef. And then we've also launched two um, interactive data visualization, visualization dashboards allowing you to explore and generate results from each of those surveys, which um, Alice and Discovery AI have helped us um, tremendously with. Um, and um, access to the data, we've um, uh, lodged our data in, a, in the CSRO data access portal and um, that has a persistent online repository with a uh, DOI that um, so that and it's public is accessible that data as well so you can access the data behind um, a lot of these um, reports and dashboards um, and now I'll just launch into some of the kind of results um, so in 2021, our core sample of residents in the Great Bear Reef catchment region is shown on the map in postcodes that overlo overlap with the catchments. The survey was conducted in June and July of 2021, and we just had under two, two and a half thousand uh, respondents. We used uh, three methods. The first was an online survey panel supplied by a market research provider involving more than 1,500 people who periodically take online surveys aged 18 years and over and who are demographically representative of the region. The second method used a trial to supplement the numbers was recruitment via paid social media, social media advertising in catchment postcodes with a link to the same online survey. And the third method was via a telephone survey of 300 people focused on regional areas that had previously been hard to, cap, to reach. The end result of this was improved geographical representation when compared with our previous surveys in 2013 and 2017 and at a lower cost. However, the use of new methods and expanded geography means that the time, site, time series comparisons have to be treated with caution. And so for these comparisons, which I'll go to soon, we'll took a subsample from each year of people who had visited the Great Barrier Reef in the previous 12 months to ensure the comparisons are valid and, and represent comparable cohorts. Um, so just for a quick reference, this was our sampling in 2013 and 2017, which was done mostly face to face at 14 coastal towns with survey responses entered into an iPad. Um, in 2013, our core sample included more than 3,000 residents of the Great Barrier Reef coastal region. And in 2017, we had more than 1,900. What we haven't re replicated since 2017 are the tourists, tourism operators, commercial fishers and a national survey of Australian Uh, Patina, I think you just might have got on mute. Yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, I'm not sure how that, that happened. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not sure. <laughs> I could have been Oh, uh, hi, Patina. I think uh, someone might be uh, muting um, us because I just got muted as well. So you're on mute. Yeah, it keeps jumping onto mute for some reason. Yeah. yeah, I can hear you now. So hopefully everyone, if you can just be really careful, please don't uh, mute other participants. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, okay. Um, so yeah, back to some results from 2021. Um, first, I'll cover a snapshot of the 2021 sample before going into some time series comparisons. Um, here are some general statistics about the catchment residents and their use of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, did you know that 50% of catchment residents visited the Great Barrier Reef for recreation in the previous 12 months and 14% visited at least monthly? For reference, um, we, we define the Great Barrier Reef in this survey as, as including all the land and water from the beaches on the coast, the bays and creeks, the islands, the open waters, and of course the coral reefs, essentially covering the habitats within the World Heritage Area. We then asked respondents whether they prefer to visit the Great Barrier Reef over other places for their recreation, and 54% 
said they preferred visiting the Great Barrier Reef over other places and 26% indicated very strongly the Great Barrier Reef is their preferred place of recreation. Um, what does very strongly mean? It means they gave a rating score of 9 or 10 on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is um, very strongly disagree and 10 equals very strongly agree. A rating of 6, of six and above is categorised as agreement, a rating of 5 and below it are uh, categorised as disagreement. Um, next, we were looking at catchment residence dependence on the Great Barrier Reef. And nearly a fifth of catchment resident, residents depend on the Great Barrier Reef for some of their household income. And 9% told us that they were strongly dependent on the reef of related work contributing 50% or more to their household income. Of those people with at least some financial dependence, 44% 40, were associated with the tourism sector, 16% with the government agency, 11% with fishing, and another 11% were associated with science and education. Um, one of the Reef 2050 object, objectives is that people maintain or grow their attachment to the Great Barrier Reef, and there are several indicators and metrics that contribute to assessing this, like place attachment, place identity, and pride. As shown here, 63% of catchment residents said that living close to the reef is important to them because of their lifestyle. 53% agreed that the reef is part of their identity, and 90% of catchment resident, residents indicated that they feel proud that the Great Barrier Reef is a World Heritage Area, and more than two-thirds strongly agreed with this statement. Um, in this next slide, we're comparing residents' ratings of a series of statements about services and benefits derived from the reef. We can present each item as a percentage indicating the proportion of people who value the ecosystem service or personally derive to benefit. For example, 82% of residents place a very high value on the reef's biodiversity with ratings of 9 or 10. And we could also rank them using the mean ratings on the 10-point scale as shown in this figure, where biodiversity is the highest valued attribute of the REIT among all things we listed here in the survey. As we go across the, the list, we can see more of a spread in the distribution of responses, and these items allow us to identify different attitudinal groups in the community who value different aspects to a different extent. Why might this be useful? Well, different values might be associated with different types of reef users or groups with different perceptions of the health of the reef or its threats or even their support for management initiatives. So as I present a few more figures like these, you might be prompted to ask, why do some people think that? And, th and through further analysis, this is something that we can look into further. Uh, this figure shows ratings of the health of different habitat types in the Great Barrier Reef as they perceive them. This uses a five-point um, categorical scale, as shown along the bottom. Very poor to excellent and a don't know option. So here we see that 21% of the catchment residents perceiving coral reefs to be in poor or very poor condition. Conversely, 47% perceive them to be in good or excellent health. Now, as we know, community perceptions don't always align with scientific consensus, but these results are a useful indicator of community understanding and awareness. And again, we can identify factors that might influence those perceptions or attitudes that might be associated with them. For example, if some people think that coral reefs are in excellent health, then those people might not think a particular management intervention is necessary. For example, crown of, th um, crown of thorns starfish control or coral restoration or zoning. And we have some survey questions coming up that allow us to explore that further. The previous figure was about perceived health or the state of different habitat values, but this figure is about the perceived problems presented in the Great Barrier Reef, things that are manifested and observable that might contribute to e ecosystems health. Um, like the DIPSA model, state and impact, and the next slide will be about perceived threats, the driver's pressures, we don't use the, D, the DIPSA or other technical term, terminology in the survey questions for accessibility reasons. So here we see that the public perceptions of environmental problems impacts in the Great Barrier Reef among residents in the Great Barrier Reef catchment. The top of the scale shows the proportion of people who consider each to be a big or very big problem. And we can see a large proportion of the community seeing most of these things as such. 70 plus percent perceive loss of coral cover to be a big or very big problem, 60% for loss of seagrass and 66% perceive low fish abundance as a big problem and I wonder what extent it represents recreational fishes. 
And here we, we have perceived threats, drive, drivers and pressures ranked from most to least serious as perceived by catchment residents. And there's climate change in the middle. While the mean score for climate change is not the highest, this item did get the highest proportion of people rating it as an extremely serious threat. The mean score is brought down by 10% of residents who perceive climate change as a minor threat and 9% who think it does not represent a threat, a threat at all. This might prompt us to ask why do they think that and in whom do they place their trust when it comes to information about the reef? I'm guessing it's not the scientists or managers who have been quite consistently saying that climate change is the biggest threat for many years. In the survey, we actually asked this question in another way, which I'll show you soon, as open-ended and without a list of items, and we can see some of the changes in these perceptions over the last decade. But first, stewardship. Now, there's a ca caveat here. There's a thing called social desirability bias, which makes people tend to overstate their participation in, acti in activities that are perceived as virtuous, like the sorts of risk smart activities that we've listed here. But this is still useful and indicative, and we're hoping that it can calibrate it or triangulate it with data collected by other means under the uh, stewardship project currently in its design phase. We also think that asking questions like these and reporting them in comms raises uh, public awareness, but that's a difficult causal link to establish empirically. Anyway, there's a clear result here that most people say that they do, do these few things on the left that are relatively easy to do, but we see a drop off in self-reported participation in more, more above the norm activities, like reporting suspicious activities to the authorities, participating community activities like cleanups and restorations and reporting marine life sightings via Eye on, the, Eye on the Reef app. And by looking more closely at these groups of people, we can learn more about what motivates them to do that and whether this is associated with other act attitudes, values or perceptions about the reef and its management. These next few items are some of the things that um, motivates people to adopt pro-environmental behaviours. There's been a lot of research into predictive factors like these in recent years, and we know they're strongly correlated with the adoption of stewardship behaviours. Things like sense of individual responsibility, self-efficacy and normative beliefs, for example, um, questions for each shown here. What's good? Most people, 83%, feel responsible to reduce their impacts on the reef, but a lot of people, 55%, feel that they cannot make a personal difference, and that's not so good, but how can how could that be addressed? Well, engagement campaigns could show people what they can do and the effect that their efforts will have. Reinforcing descriptive norms also helps. If other people are doing are doing it, so can I. There are sorts of these 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 are the sorts of results where I think we we uh, collectively like to see an improvement over time that can probably be influenced by reef managers and community leaders. This next set of questions is new to our uh, cell team and I think these will be valuable going forward. We asked, in your opinion, how important are the following initiatives for managing the Great Barrier Reef? This is an indicator of public support for a range of manage management initiatives shown along the x-axis. Like increased compliance to reduce illegal fishing, which the community community considers very important. Likewise, for reducing rubbish and plastics, improving land management for better water quality and COTS control. And looking along the list, we see a majority of catchment residents recognising most of these initiatives are very important. But it may be, however, that the benefits and importance of some of these initiatives have not been very well communicated, like, for example, improving traditional, co traditional owner co-management and custodianship of the Great Boo Reef or assisted coral adaptation. I think there might also be some correlation here among people who think carbon emission reduction is unimportant and those who perceive climate change as a non-threat. And also on the right there, the smaller graph shows that the proportion of people who think that additional interventions to manage the Great Barrier Reef are needed or not. These results are complementary to uh, another study uh, whose report was published um, on a website in July which investigates public support for specific described interventions in much greater detail. I'm now moving on to some of our gov governance metrics, some, something that I hope you'll find relevant to reef management. And we can see some problems in, and we can see some problems in the eyes of the community. Only 40% of our respondents said that they were satisfied with how the reef is managed. So that's 60% of catchment resident, residents expressing dissatisfaction 
Unpacking that broad metric into some of the potential contributing factors, we see that only 36% of the community thinks that decisions about the, managing the reef are made in a fair way. Only 31% see opportunities for themselves to have a say in how the reef is managed, and less than a quarter of people feel that they have some influence over how the reef is managed. This, not, this does not paint a great picture and suggests there is room for improvement or better engagement to improve people's understanding about how the reef is managed and how they can contribute. But on a positive note, when compared with a range of other institutions that provide information about the reef, the reef authority is highly trusted. This is really important for obvious reasons, and it's important to note that these scores have changed over time, which I'll show soon, but what drives this change is a really good question, and this is a topic we're currently exploring, exploring for a uh, forthcoming paper. Um, On to the time series comparisons. I mentioned earlier we had a we had to use a subsample to compare apples with apples, or in this case, residents who had visited the reef in the previous 12 months to make the reliable comparisons. Fortunately, we still have a large sample to work with. Back to the trust question. While trust in scientists from research institutions has consistently been ranked the highest amongst our listed information sources, we observed a significant drop in these rating scores from 2017 to 2021. Looking back to 2013, we can see that trust in the Marine Park Authority was relatively low and that their trust ratings increased significantly in, two, in the 2017 survey. And there's no significant difference in the mean trust rating for the Reef Authority between 2017 and 2021. Interestingly also, from 2017 to 21, we saw significant declines in trust ratings for international um, NGOs, non-government organisations, and also for people's trust in their family, friends and work co colleagues. We can't pinpoint the exact cause for these changes, but anecdotally, I do find the latter result somewhat relatable, as I think certain relatives may have been watching too much Fox Tower. In public trust, is public trust in, in institutions influenced, influenced by media na narrative, narratives? Absolutely. Maxine Newland and colleagues um, gave a seminar recently about this not so long ago. And over the last few years, we've seen a lot of contested narratives in media reporting about the reefs and of the reef and water quality science in particular. This particular result might also be effective, um, may also be effect on those narratives. We ask people to identify which of those statements on the right best describes their beliefs about the risks posed by climate change to the reef. In 2017, we saw a big increase in the proportion of people who recognised climate change as a threat requiring immediate action. And in a couple of papers, we hypothesised that this was influenced by the mass coral bleaching seen in the previous two summers. We did not expect to see a swing back in 2021 and an increase in the proportion of people who either I needed evidence to form an opinion about climate change and how it may threaten the reef or think climate change is not a threat to the reef. I should note that we added a new category category to this question in 2021, I do not believe in climate change. And look, there's 5% of us of sample, so we're going to keep that item in, the, in there for the foreseeable future. Despite that unexpected shift, we can at least confidently say that the majority of people have accepted the scientific consensus, consensus and recognise that climate change as the reef's biggest threat. Here the time series of that unprompted open-ended question, what do you think are the three most serious threats to the Great Barrier Reef? And this has changed quite a lot in the last decade, as you can see. In 2013, the top ranked result was shipping, which, were, which has been bumped all the way down to ninth place in 2021. Threat, percent, threat perceptions of cots, crown thorns, starfish are also ranked relatively low in eighth place and hasn't changed much over time. Uh, pollution is a big category here and it's included a range of responses like marine debris, plastics, litter and chemicals. And the fishing category combines responses such as recreational fishing, commercial fishing and overfishing. Finally, um, my last results slide, which is the very first question we ask in the survey, even before we've defined what we mean by the Great Barrier Reef. Um, what are the first words that come to mind when you think of the Great Barrier Reef? And the most frequently mentioned words are in the largest font size and, and uh, beautiful coral and fish are at the top of the ranking in all three years. Uh, we've coded these words for basic emotional valence or sentiment with blue words having a positive valence in the GBR context and negative words are shown in red. In 2017, we saw a big increase in negative se sentiment with red words like bleaching, climate change, dying and endangered standing out in the middle word cloud. 
and that negative sentiment seems to be have subsided in 2021. We can also see an increase in positive sentiment quite a lot more um, in blue. The trend over this time series is an overall decrease in neutral words and an increase in emotional words. Now, this sort of result might not inform adaptive management, but sentiment analysis generally provide useful context and insights into community perceptions and emotive issues and how these change over time. Uh, so that's the end of the results, that which mainly can be found in the, the reports, but they're also um, seen um, in the dashboards that uh, Discover AI helped us develop. Um, and um, also uh, keen to know questions, what questions um, have emerged if you've been exploring um, the dashboards and we're keen to know how you might use or apply this information um, in uh, management context. Um, so these are the, the new data visualised um, dashboards and um, there was two developed, one for the main survey and one for the uh, regional report cards of the Great Barrier Ridge. Um, and that's all I really have. Um, I'll stop sharing now and uh, I think uh, Alice and uh, others are going to provide more context on the Power BI aspect of it all. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much, Patina. That was a really good overview and it was really interesting just to hear uh, how the survey, um, like the kind of evolution of the survey and um, what the different results kind of practically mean for reef management moving forward. Um, I especially didn't appreciate how much effort goes into collecting representative samples of survey data. So that was really interesting, um, especially thinking about how we can make the best use of this data as well um, because a lot of effort and thought go into creating representative survey questions and trying to get those out to different audiences um, so it's even more uh, important to um, uh, kind of treat that data and visualize it and communicate it effectively um, does anyone have any uh, questions for Patina? I saw that we've got a comment in the chat from our friends at Power BI Days moderator <laughs> uh, saying that's a lot of information, insights, analytics and designs involved. Super awesome. So thank you. Thanks a lot for that. Um, I've also pasted a link to the dashboards if people want to explore them. Um, but at this stage, I don't think we have uh, any questions for Bettina? So feel free to, um, as you're thinking about it, as myself and Daniel are um, going through our bit and you're having a look at the results, uh, just type them in the chat as well. Um, but thank you so much, Bettina. That was awesome. Um, so I'll just quickly share my screen. Um, so Bettina's given us a bit of an overview of the um, uh, the results and a background in the survey. What I wanted to take you through now is um, a couple of the lessons learnt uh, that we got out of completing this study uh, with Patina and the team at CSIRO. So visualising survey data in Power BI, um, it might not be something that you're that is typically uh, done. I think majority of our Power BI reports, we focus on analysing more uh, quantitative data rather than qualitative data. So we got a lot of learnings out of this. Um, uh, but before I dive in, I'll just quickly bring up the Power BI reports as well, just to give you a little bit of a tour. So I might just focus on one of the reports, uh, the regional report card. Um, you can see uh, that we've got a nice uh, kind of front cover page. Uh, there's some information about the study um, and links to get more info as well. Um, and then we dive into the survey results here. Um, so you can see that we've got a lot of, there are a lot of different questions asked in the survey and uh, the nature of the questions were all slightly different. Um, so there are a lot of different uh, visuals here used to address those questions. Um, so you can flick through them using, uh, this is a bookmark navigator at the top. Uh, you can filter on different uh, demographics and compare the results across uh, different uh, genders or age group or regions. Um, and there's lots of different visuals here used as well. Um, so feel free to play around with the Power BI reports um, online um, just to get a feel for it. Uh, but my first tip, something that we learnt uh, very early on, 
is when you're working with survey data, make sure to spend the time structuring your data. So spend time creating a robust data model and take care to assign all the supporting information you might wanna use when developing your Power BI report. So think about things like, how do you wanna slice and interact with your survey questions? Think about how do you want to present this data in the chart? So uh, you might want to use uh, friendly names and different things like that. Sort order is always important when we're working with uh, more qualitative data, which is text-based. So if we take a step back and have a look at what we kind of got at the start of the project, um, uh, the team went out and they collected a lot of different survey information um, from uh, almost like paper surveys. So these are this is an example of the different kind of types of questions uh, which appear in the survey. So you can see that they're um, kind of different questions. There's different uh, scales, there's different tick boxes and things like that uh, that the um, audience uh, can assign different answers to. And then when you have a look at the raw data, what does this look like? Uh, there is a lot of data. So it was very nice and neatly organized, but you can see it's not quite ready for Power BI just yet. Uh, along the top, we've got all of our survey questions. Um, so uh, while this is very descriptive for data people, it's not so descriptive. It's not kind of plain English. It's not what we want to put into a Power BI visual just yet. And we've got a lot of data. So majority of the results were in numeric format, but we also have free text format as well. Um, so you have to spend time thinking about how can we order this so that Power BI can talk to this data. So think about things like um, bringing in uh, a bit more information about the variable uh, kind of names. So we've got a supporting data set here that links all of those uh, survey questions up to a friendly question name a parent question, what is the child question with this, as well as the exact question from the survey. So a lot of supporting information here, um, as well as different things like for the chart legends, uh, what different components do we want to put in, um, and also uh, all of the individual values for all of these different variables. So you can see there's a lot of, um, a lot of work goes in the back end to make something that uh, Power BI can talk to. So if we take a look at the Power BI kind of data model, you can see that we've got a really nice uh, clean data model with a fact table which stores all of our answers. Um, and then we've got our different dimension tables here which are used for the slices and the axes of the different charts. Um, so that was the first lesson and first tip. Um, the second uh, tip is to spend time selecting the appropriate visual for your data. So survey data is different to more uh, quantitative data. We're working with kind of words and counts uh, of data percentages. Um, so the type of visuals that we found work best for this data in our experience were things like bar charts and column charts. Uh, word clouds are really effective. Um, and even explore different bespoke visuals like Deneb. Um, so I'll just quickly show a couple of the visuals. Um, here you can see we've got um, some word clouds, which we're using to present uh, the kind of keywords associated with different waterways. Um, so this is a custom visual. So it's from the uh, custom visual marketplace. It's just a word cloud uh, visual here. Um, if we have a look at some of the other visuals that we're using, you can see that we've got um, just a bar, simple bar charts here. Um, and we're presenting results in different ways. Here we've got um, uh, just kind of the mean result. Here we've got a breakdown of the proportions of survey respondents that answered these specific questions. Um, and we're also using a couple, I think we've got a few column charts as well as matrices. So really play around with the different type of visual uh, that you want to include. Um, and of course, Daniel will talk about the data visual that he created as well. Uh, the third kind of tip um, uh, that we learnt on this project is really tailor your report and the type of information you're presenting for your target audience. 
Um, so the target audience in this project was really mixed. It was both technical and non-technical audiences because um, it's going, it is published up on uh, CSIRO's website. Uh, so it is, we did want it to be accessible for the general public. So using things like plain English and friendly names, um, but also a, a large number of um, audience members are from a technical and scientific background. And these audience members are really interested in the exact survey question um, and they want to know the detail as well. Um, so let's take a look at a couple of different techniques that we've used to try to achieve that for different audiences. Um, the first is just thinking about how your end users are going to navigate and interact with, um, uh, with your report. And a tip for that, if you are especially publishing your report for public audiences, um, or also internal users who aren't so familiar with Power BI, um, is that you can always include something like a navigation video, some instructions to help uh, new users navigate and understand how to interact with the report. Um, another tip is just to think about navigation. Try to make it um, consistent across each of your page and as intuitive as possible. So we're using our buttons here to navigate between pages, um, also icons as well. Um, to really try to communicate the page at a glance. Um, we've got the bookmark navigator at the top here to navigate between our visuals on the existing page. And we're using consistent slices across the different pages uh, down the left-hand pane. Um, and one thing which is really um, interesting that we've done here is we've used uh, sync slices to keep whatever selection um, uh, from your slicer across all of the pages. Um, so little tricks like that to try to make your navigation as uh, seamless as possible. Um, but for the really technical audiences, uh, this, these dashboards went through a couple of rounds of stakeholder feedback and refinement. And overwhelmingly, <laughs> the largest uh, response of the feedback was uh, the end users really wanted to know exactly what the survey question was uh, that this question was addressing. So while we have a plain English title, a nice short um, title for the top of the charts, down the bottom uh, we included uh, the exact uh, survey question as well as the number of respondents. Um, so that was another uh, kind of tip, just really try to tailor your Power BI reports for the specific audiences. Um, so I think uh, that, was, that was all I wanted to cover today. I'll just check in the chat. Um, cool, so we did have a question about the type of license uh, that we're using to share with the public and Daniel's replied that um, we're using the Power BI publish to web uh, sharing, so um, because the data is public. Um, and another question about Deneb, which is a really uh, good kind of segue into Daniel's uh, presentation today. Um, so Daniel, without further ado, did you want to get started? Yep, yeah, I'm good to go. <clears throat> Just make sure I can find the right screen. Yeah. So hopefully that's all coming through. Awesome, yeah, it looks great. Lovely. So we've been over the, the crux of the, the report that we've built. Um, one of the key things we wanted to do with this data was to visualize it in a, in a, in a more user-friendly way, particularly some of the questions that had a sentiment attached to them. So what we have here is the visual that we ended up producing. And what we can see here is we've got a question that has a scale along it, um, ranging from very poor through to excellent in terms of sentiment. And then we have, I don't know, which is kind of more of a neutral feeling. So, when working with um, CSRO and CELTEP, what um, their requirements were, were quite uh, along the lines of what we're showing you here. We wanted to have a visual that could show the, the swing of sentiment, negative or positive, but also outline the neutral data. So this is what's known as a Likert scale for people that may have seen this before. Um, and there's so many different theories and ideas on how this could be presented. So a common, sort of approach. There's, there's kind of four versions that people may tend to use out in the wild that you might have seen. So one of the most common scenarios is a 100% stack bar. So that's where we've got everything's normalized on the same scale and we see the 100% all within the same space. 
Um, and these examples are taken from a blog called Daydreaming Numbers, uh, which is a really detailed uh, set of posts. And also for reference, I have a lot of data viz books on my shelf, but I really like better data visualizations by John Schwabish, um, which is uh, a lot of my inspiration was taken from that as well for this particular presentation, but also the work we did. So yeah, the 100% stack, stack bar is a pretty good chart in terms of how it looks, but what's difficult to see is um, which way things are going. You have to kind of manually go through with your eyes and try and work it all out. So we can see that there's there's a skew of negative, but we don't really know how negative. We have to really work hard to do it. Um, another option, which is more like the one we ended up with, was having the neutrals broken out to the side so we can see them relative to the to the positives and negatives, but also moving an origin line down the middle here where we've got a negative swing and a positive swing and, and we've got this sort of part to whole visibility. So that's quite nice because we can see the proportion of sentiment, but it also breaks the neutrals out. Um, so we can still see that they exist, but they don't kind of get in the way. Um, so we can sort of see roughly how much space they take up out of the responses. Another variation on this one is to have a similar design, but to put the neutrals in the middle and people do choose this as a solution, but it's one of these cases where when you weigh it up, neutral doesn't really swing negative or positive. So we've got this sort of distribution here um, that kind of implies we might be more negative when actually uh, we, we may not be. So it's you have to do some work with, again, with your eyes and your brain to kind of scan through this and see what works. Another option is to kind of maybe consider breaking them out into a technique known as small multiples, uh, where we have a, a single chart broken into little categories, but each one has its own axis and scale that's kind of shared. And here we can see we've got the answers moving across from left to right in order of sentiment, and we can kind of see the values. But what's challenging about this is it takes a lot of space and it's, it's hard to kind of visually clump them together because they're so spaced out. So Whilst each has its pros and its cons, it's really a case of looking at the situation. So we had been through this process uh, and CELTEP had, and CSIRO had, had basically sort of ha had a, an idea of mine that was more like number two, um, because this was felt that it would be more suitable for, for a public audience. So this was the, the idea we'd liked to work with. So one of the challenges with something like this is there's nothing out of the box in Power BI that will do this. We've probably got options for number one, and I have used this in the past, and number four. But two and three are both very tricky, but we're focusing on two at the moment. So we had the additional requirement of having some statistics out here. Um, so we then start to have to look at what's available in the custom visual domain. So in terms of what we can do in Power BI, this is a you know this is a quick overview of the stuff that you've got out of the box. We can use core visuals uh, from the palette here. We can install custom visuals from the marketplace. Um, we've got the option of doing some creative modeling, and you can see from Alice's presentation that we we built a really nice model to be able to make this as easy as possible to slice and dice and filter. But we couldn't really do much more with the visuals there. For those that are a little more savvy, we have the ability to do R and Python visuals. So we can add a visual to the canvas and we can, if we've got knowledge of R or Python, we can write some code and we can have a visual that's very bespoke. The challenge with R or Python is, well, one of the key challenges here is we wanted to put this in a published web scenario. So we can't publish visuals that use R or Python to the public uh, facing Power BI reports because uh, they're not supported. So the next step is if we don't have a custom visual that fits our boat, uh, we can develop one from scratch using the uh, the custom visuals development kit uh, and that's actually how custom visuals are written so we hope people use this so that we've got something available and some people do do that so we're having a lot of visuals springing up now and this is a small example there's more than 500 visuals in the marketplace but there are some that are very very focused on helping you to do bespoke design inside power bi and we've got examples such as valq and inforiver which are more geared towards financial scenarios. We've got Sandance, which is a Microsoft research developed visual, which is very exploratory, uh, but it's still very, uh, very scientific. We've got the Synoptic Panel, which is a fantastic visual for, for building um, dynamic um, data based images from, from 
you take almost like a, 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 a scalable vector graphic design and you bind data to it so you can actually make things happen, but it's a fairly static design. We've got a tool called PureViz, which is a really great visual for, for binding dynamic portions to scalable vector graphics as well, very similar to Synoptic Panel, but a little more extensible. We have one called Charticulator, which is by Microsoft, and that's a, a really powerful tool that doesn't require a lot of coding, but it does require you to think a bit differently about how you build visuals. You have to build them from primitive objects rather than choosing the visual you think you need. Um, all of these kind of sit on the side of the low code line, so they're really accessible to get into, but they all have constraints and use cases. On the side of the, the 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 low code getting more towards code we've got we can try html based visuals and we do use those a lot um, at discovery i but also a lot of people use those as ways of building very uh, dynamic rich content um, still didn't fulfill our needs but it ultimately boiled down to the fact that we were looking at a visual called denip which is available from the marketplace the app source marketplace and one of the advantages of denip is it is built in a very similar way to r and python so you have an interface where you can actually specify how you want a visual to build uh, using languages, none as Baker and Baker Lite. What's really nice about Denip though, is it is built on the same framework that the visual SDKs and custom visuals are in Power BI. So they actually work in published web and they support things like interactivity and they're very, very customizable. So whereas all these visuals here generally tend to have a user interface, at the cost of the user interface, Denib uh, allows you to use some very simple languages to, to, to build some very powerful visuals. So in terms of how that language looks, actually, I should probably talk a little bit about Denib first in, in a bit more capacity. So Denib is, uh, is a visual uh, called declarative, declarative Visualization in Power BI. And this puts the Vega and Vega Lite languages, which are two very high level visual languages inside a single Power BI visual that you can use to then build your own visuals. And Deneb is a certified visual. So what that means is you can design a visual that runs as if it's certified inside Power BI, which is quite a cool thing to be able to do. There's a couple of resources here um, that link to the languages in the website. I did put the Deneb website in the in the chat, but there's a couple of other resources that are that you're able to see. I'm just going for time here. Um, one of the neat things is the languages are JSON based. So JSON is a data storage format. It's not necessarily code. You, you do have to almost think of it like code, but it's a very easy way for data professionals to start thinking about it. So what's nice about JSON is it's self-describing. So we can see on the right here, there's a whole bunch of things, but it's very easy to infer what's going on. You can basically tell who I am, where I'm from, how old I am, what my hobbies are, and a little bit about my pets and understand that some of those things are repeating elements and some of those things have types like numbers or text. And it's very, very easy to read through, which is really, really nice. So a very, very quick tour of that. So this is our visual. Uh, Denamp is uh, installed from AppSource. So we can do that by going to get more visuals inside Power BI. Always runs a bit slow over Teams, unfortunately. And in the search box, we could just type Deneb, or if we knew what the languages were, we could type Vega. And we get this visual in the marketplace here. So we can click on that, check it's the one we want. We can see that it's certified and we can add it to our report just like any other visual. When that's added to the canvas, we get a, a, a container. that doesn't look like any other visual. And the trick to Deneb is we, we add the fields we need and then we edit the language inside the visual. So for, for time, we will just go back to where we were. And if I click on the visual, if I click on the visual, why isn't Sorry, Dad, you're you're it's, in, it's cause we're using bookmarks. It's in a little group. Ah, yeah, I think you yeah. have to click, click. Quick, quick. It was all ready to go. Here we go. <laughs> so we can see we have a lot of stuff in the values pane. So one of the key things to think about with Deneb is with Power BI visuals, when you add them to the canvas, if you had a bar chart or a pie chart or a visual that has a specific use case, they have what we call data roles. Those are the buckets that you see 
on the canvas. So if you if you had a bar chart, you've got one for the axis, one for the measures. They have very defined purposes. So anything you add to those visuals has to be used. Whereas with visuals like Deneb and so on, you can actually add any field you like, and you just got to think of it like a table. So if we turn this into a table visual, we can see what's behind it. Um, and the things that Alice showed you that went into that data model help us to structure the um, the output. So what's really nice is, is that we, we've got our standard data like our year on our category, but we've also got things like color and font color and weighting. And these are things that aren't seen by you, but we can use those to calculate the output that you see see just then. So we've got we've got our, our backing data set that sits behind it. And we've got little things like show statistics and various other things that help us the, to build a visual from uh, from this from this foundation. So we can see that table turns us into something that looks like this, and we can actually click on this visual. And the, some visuals don't have this, but there are some visuals that have what's called advanced editing. So when we click on the visual header, we can click edit, and we get a new user interface come up in front of us, which is a little bit. A little bit slow because of teams, but we essentially have three areas here. We've got the visual that ends up on our canvas, and this is the container that it sits in, and we can see how it fits. We've got some debugging information here that shows us the data set behind the visual. And we've got this section here on the left, which I'll just tweak a little bit just to give us a little bit more size. But we can start using the languages inside here to build up a visual. So the key part we've got without delving too much into it because we don't have a lot of time today. Um, a session on Deneb would normally be about 45 minutes to an hour on its own. Um, we start to lay out how the visual looks and the key parts are we've got this thing here called a V concat and that's a vertical concatenation. So we've got two entries inside there. One of those is for our legend. And the other one is for the rest of our chart. And then the rest of our chart obviously has its own declaration of things as well, but we essentially break all these things down into simple areas, but each of that data behind it turns into something we can use. So we can see we're binding colors. We're actually shading labels differently based on different rules. We've got our breakout here of our neutral. We've also annotated the chart with positive and negative um, labels and show the span. But in some cases, we've got statistics such as mean and standard deviation. And then it's really nice as well because we can actually integrate things like tooltips straight into Power BI. So we've been able to link those up using some of the fields. And we can do our own calculations and transformations inside here as well. So we pass the data in that we think we need, but we can also do our own additional aggregations or filtering and things like that to tailor the visual how we need. So we can explode this out and we can start to see the kind of way we, we build these things up. Um, this is quite a complicated visual. It took a little bit of R&D and uh, iterative development, but that's the beautiful thing about it. We were able to work collaboratively with, uh, with the team to, to show them progress. And we were able to design uh, as we went as well. We knew what we were aiming for, but we were able to give feedback and, and change course very, very quickly. Um, so in building this, we got we got a pretty good outcome. And what's nice about this is that it's responsive because of how that model works. We've got categories here, very poor, poor, fair, good, excellent. But if we were to say choose this question here, where our categories actually change from a scale of one to ten, our colors and labels adapt accordingly. So this model helps to drive that visual design quite nicely. Um, so once we got this one working, we thought a little bit about how we could um, you know, use it a little more. Uh, and one of the cool things about something like this is it lets us fail fast as well. So when we have an idea, we could prototype it and it may or may not work. Uh, and in this case, it didn't quite work, but it let us have a go at trying to see if we could push the idea further. So we looked earlier about the, you know, we, there's all these different ways to think about how that data could be visualized. But <clears throat> how could we then break it out by another dimension? So how could we look at it by, say, comparing region by region and still pack in all that information? And the short answer is it, it didn't go well, because, but we were able to find out why. So when we took that design, we started to prototype it further using Deneb again, just to sort of see what would happen if we added this in and, and how could we how could we evolve the design? So we came up with this idea of, you know, we could maybe have the region vertically within each question, 
this doesn't show the actual values because we were just trying to think about how much space things took. And that became quite busy. There's too much going on in there. So we then had to think about a different way of doing it. Could we maybe put the region like this and offset horizontally? And we kind of got the same problem. We, we, we've got a bit more vertical room, but then we've got less horizontal room. So it's hard to see the, the part to whole relationships. And then we sort of thought about the, the comparison across the, the three survey periods that we've got. So just, just for fun and research, we, we had a look to see if we could find out a way of showing those results over time. But we, we sort of got the same challenge. Bars aren't really good for this kind of thing, but at the same time, the part to whole and the sentiment was really, really important. So we had a go with this, but again, it was just too much information to pack in. So it was quite a good exercise for us to go through with the team and, and, and try and fulfill that goal. But it was also a good way for us to really kind of definitively say, in this case, it doesn't quite work. So if we're putting this up for the public, there's just too much going on there. So I think I'm going to have to cap that there because I'm just looking at the clock and I've kind of covered everything I wanted to cover. Um, but a little bit quicker than I would like. As I say, sessions on Deneb are normally quite long and deep, but hopefully that's given you an idea as to the kind of capabilities that we can do when we work directly with people. And it's just a great way to to develop with feedback and 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 move towards a common goal. But it was it was a really great project to work on. The resulting visual was uh, really fantastic, and I, I hope it sits well in the report. Oh, thanks so much, Daniel. Yeah, I think you captured the essence there really well. And um, I totally agree. Deneb is an awesome prototyping tool. Uh, I've worked with Daniel on other full scale custom visual development uh, projects. Um, <laughs> they take a lot longer. So Deneb, um, yeah, it's really easy. Uh, to be honest, I've never actually used it because we've got Daniel, the visual author on our team. It's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> uh, but if I want to tweak it, it's so, super easy. You can kind of navigate your way through. I butcher things up. Daniel comes, cleans it up. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, so thank you so much. Is, no worries. I think just to add to that, the, the languages that sit inside Deneb are not bespoke to Microsoft or Power BI. They're actually used in many of the places. So they're very well documented. They're developed by leading people in, in the industry and they're still maintained. So all we do is we put them inside and we build the interface around it. But there's so many people already in the Power BI community that are researching this and doing their own examples and building templates because we can do templates with Deneb. And if you go to Denim's website, there's a community page which has links to all the video um, playlists we've got and various other people that are just doing stuff around if you need inspiration. And I think I've saw Greg on here who's who's Enterprise DNA. He's, he's, he's got a course on Denim, if you're a member of Enterprise DNA. Um, so there's, there's lots of uh, community resources going into this as well. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. I think yeah, if anyone is keen to learn, there's heaps of info out there. There's lots of uh, nice comments uh, from everyone loving the visual. Daniel, we've got some people who are already um, using Deneb as well, um, but no questions. So I guess um, uh, I'll just uh, run through a couple of slides just to close out um, and I'm happy to stay on um, uh, for questions um, at the end, but I am conscious of everyone's days as well. Um, so if anyone is keen, we've got our next um, session uh, next month. Uh, we've got the Water Water team back um, presenting on a data and analysis framework, best practices. Um, so feel free to sign up for that. That will be a really good one. Um, if you are keen to watch anything um, from today's or any of our previous sessions, uh, we always share them on our uh, blog and YouTube channel as well. Um, so feel free to go there and have a look. Um, and if we do have anyone on the call who's keen to present uh, at our meetup group, you can see it's a really fun, informal group. We want um, any uh, people from any uh, level of Power BI from beginner all the way through to advanced, um, anything about Power BI and the environmental or water data, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so please get in touch. We're always looking for new presenters as well. Um, but I just want to say a massive thank you to Bettina and Daniel uh, for taking the time to present today. I think it was really, really interesting just to hear uh, the evolution of the study um, and some different cool things. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I might just um, stop sharing screens now and stop the recording, uh, but happy to um, stay on if there are any extra questions as well.